Welcome back to I Heart Azalea series on Lego Legacy Heroes Unboxed. I'm Azalea. And I'm her dad. In part one, we went over some fundamentals such as speed, pep, cooldown periods, taunts, heals, looting, gold trophies, campaign energy, and mashup energy. We also went through every area of the home screen and went a bit into the idea of making your existing heroes better. In part two, we're going to repeat some items, but mainly going to assume you know the content from part one, especially what all the terms mean that we defined in part one. Part two is also going to cover fewer fundamentals and focus more on what you need to do right away to succeed. As a reminder, these videos are always targeted at people who pay no real money, so what you do to succeed will never include paying real money. So put your wallet away. Somewhere safe. Before we go into the things you do right away though, I want to establish a theme that you'll see throughout our tutorials. There will be a lot of times when you'll be able to unlock some new hero with enough battles or looting, and you might be tempted to think that getting some newer, cooler, harder to unlock hero is going to give you some big upgrade over your old boring heroes. Then you'll actually get those heroes and stick them into battle right away, and you'll find out that the new hero is terrible. So you'll go look for some other new hero to replace the other hero that wasn't working out, and find out that this newer new hero is terrible too. Hopefully you'll watch this video before this gets too out of hand, or otherwise figure out that unlocking new heroes doesn't get you very far in LEGO Legacy, with some exceptions about how some missions require a certain type of hero, so you aren't allowed to play the mission or are stuck playing without a full team of five. What gets you places is taking those bad heroes you already have and turning them into good heroes. You'll also need the right balance of roles. Don't use a team of tanks. So here's the theme. Every hero is good if you invest in the hero. Every hero is bad if you don't invest in the hero. You'll see some stuff from the pay-to-win people about how good or bad these heroes are if they're seven stars and max everything, like they have all the gear, but this doesn't matter because you don't have that choice. They all start terrible, and leveling them up is all the same difficulty, but it's not all the same difficulty to do all the other parts of making them good, especially starring them up. Also, some heroes might have a head start because you got them earlier or needed to make them better for some event. Azalea, who do you think is the best minifigure in the game? Magisto. I think that Magisto is the best too. Do you remember when we first got Magisto? All I remember is that he was terrible. Magisto is our third hero who starts at 3 stars, after only Chicken Suit Guy and Pirate Princess Argenta. When we got these two heroes to level 50 and compared them with other heroes of the same level, stars, and gear, we found out that they're both among the worst heroes in total awesomeness. But at the time, Chicken Suit Guy and Argenta seemed like maybe our two best heroes, whereas Magisto was behind several two-star heroes who were the same level. Even Headley the Hedgeman. What's going on is that at the start, all your heroes are terrible, even your two three-star heroes. But you're battling with foes who are so unfathomably terrible that they make your terrible heroes look awesome by comparison, covering up the weaknesses in your heroes. In the meantime, you're adding gear to your heroes until they become respectable. But Magisto comes in with no gear, and he's really hard to gear up because he wants a million basic Banana One plans and you already used all of yours on a bunch of heroes such as Chicken Suit Guy, Captain Redbeard, Pirate Cook Bart, Locust, and Nia. It's a long process, but you can get him gear and stars so he'll survive and be able to use his passive ability, Wizard of the 8x8 Round, which is incredible once you get it to tier 5. As a reminder, investing in a hero is mainly about energy. You don't have enough energy to loot for everybody's codex tiles and gear, so you only pick some, and those are the ones in which you're investing. Okay, so we got that idea out of the way. We also have to do some fundamentals that you need to know right away to make it so you can understand the tasks you have to do right away. Breaking news! Breaking news! The game had a major update. Oh no. We were about 90% done with this video, and we already made a part one. I don't want to go change everything in this, so I guess we'll just have to add some things explaining when something changes because of the update. Is everything from part one still good? No. In part one, you said that the highest pit town level is 50 and the highest gear is 6. They changed the highest level to 60 and the highest gear to 7. And there's now this grand gear which looks pink like the gear from those crazy foes from the challenges. And they ruined Paramedic Poppy. What? 
Let me take a look. Oh no. In part one, I said her heal painkillers goes from a 10% heal to a 25% heal with a 30% chance to reassemble a defeated hero. Now they've totally taken away her reassembling a defeated hero for no reason. They've messed up the healing so it's 20% plus 5% per stack of courage instead of 25%, and they increased the cooldown period from 3 to 4. You can get the cooldown to 3 by using patch up on herself, but it's kind of a wasted turn that stops you from getting the courage stack you need for the heal to be 25% again. And they redid Dr. Kelvin. Frostbite phaser is actually good now. Okay, we showed a clip of the frostbite phaser in part 1, but the point of it was to show that Pep is that blue circle about the turns. I think the old frostbite phaser is better at doing that. Okay, the update just happened and I'm already sick of it. Let's get back to the how-to. Azalea, we talked about attacks, taunts, and heals in part 1. What's something we didn't cover? Tags. Roles are one form of tags. Officially, there are four roles. Attacker, healer, tank, and support. At the time of this recording, there were 24 attackers, 11 tanks, 4 healers, and 24 supports. Attackers and healers are pretty clear. Attackers attack the foes to defeat them. Healers can attack, but their main job is healing your heroes to stop them from getting defeated. Tanks' job is to taunt. They're designed to have a lot of max health and defense, which makes them harder to defeat than your other heroes. And support is just a weird bucket category into which the game decided to throw way too many heroes. Supposedly, supports are heroes who deal with buffs, which are these green circles designed to create positive effects for a team, and with debuffs, which are these red circles designed to create negative effects for a team. But really, all the heroes deal with buffs and debuffs. For example, your first three heroes are the attacker Chicken Suit Guy, the healer Hiker, and the tank Crook Chuck. Chicken Suit Guy adds the buff Attack Up 1 with his special ability Drumstick Kick, and the debuff Dizzy with his special ability Wings of Fury. Hiker's passive ability Wood Scout's Protection adds the buff Defense Up 1 or the buff Defense Up 2. As for tanks, they all taunt, which is a buff, except for Lloyd, who puts a buff Stealth on all the other heroes. Crook Chuck also uses the buff Defense Up 1 through his special ability Crowbar Cake for 1, and the debuff Attack Down 1 through his special ability Getting Swole to be Whole. You have to go by the official roll tags for the gear challenges and excavation in the Brickspedition event. For the purposes of winning and losing, though, I consider the heroes to have only three roles. Attacker, Healer, and Tank. If I redid the tags, I'd make the attackers Princess Storm and Yeti tanks, and I'd make the supports Jester Gogo and Police Officer Primo tanks. I'd also change seven supports into healers. Chef, Fitness Instructor, Gorwell, Magisto, Master Wu, Nia, and Pirate Cook Bart. The remaining 15 supports are attacker-style supports, although some of them, such as Skeleton York, might not be good at the attacker job. Generally speaking, the most useful combination is two attackers, two healers, and a tank. For example, lots of people use a Pirates plus Hiker team in Arena, with Captain Redbeard and Pirate Princess Argenta there to attack, Hiker and Pirate Cook Bart there to heal, and Captain Valiant there to talk. Another set of tags is Explorers and Builders. For Glyph Hunt, you can only use your Explorers. For Pip Town United, you can only use your Builders. The game might force a Builder ally on you in Glyph Hunt, or an Explorer ally on you in Pip Town United, though. You can use Explorers and Builders in Monolith Race. The next tags are for the different teams. At the time of this recording, there were seven team-style tags. Castle, City, Ghostbuster, Ninjago, Pirate, Space, and Collectible. Azalea, which of these teams do you think is the best? The Castle Crew. I think Castle is the best too, although the heroes don't have enough healing because Skeleton Castle Healer is a foe only. Castle heroes are all builders, although Skeleton York is also a pirate and an explorer. Skeleton York is a castle because he puts on a king costume, and he is a pirate because he puts on a pirate costume. Within Castle, there are two smaller tags, King's Court and Fright Knight, that give some bonuses working with some heroes or sets. Castle-only teams are required for the weekly event Book Learning, and the rarely repeating event I Fought the Law, which unlocks Police Officer Primo. There are also some Brickspedition missions that require Castle only, or Castle plus one other team, such as Collectible or Space. Castle teams are about taunting and counterattacking. Six of the ten heroes can taunt, 
and one of those is Crown King Brutus, who can make others taunt, too. They have counterattacking through the heroes Magisto and Dragon Master Burnabus, plus the sets Guarded In and Magisto's Tower. The other castle heroes that can taunt are Headley, Burnabus, Basil, Gogo, who is technically classified as a support, and the last castle hero who can taunt is Princess Storm. The next team, City, has four explorers and six builders. City-only teams are required for the weekly event Missing Materials. City heroes are about helping each other. For example, they have two of the game's four official healers, plus Chef, who is one of the four supports with an all-hero healing ability. The other two heroes that are in the tag City are Arctic Explorer Aurora, and Paramedic Poppy, and they can both reassemble a defeated hero. Except that Poppy's reassembling just got taken away by the update. Ghostbuster was the newest team style tag when this was recorded. They're all explorers. You need the four humans plus the set Ecto-1 for the rarely repeating Ghosts and Garmadon Part 2 event, which unlocks Slimer. You also need some of these for the occasionally repeating Ghosts and Garmadon Part 1 event for Ghostbuster tiles. Don't believe the commercials about them being great versus Ninjago. Only Egon Spengler is. They should say great versus spooky for Ghostbuster heroes. Ninjago heroes are all builders. There are also two smaller tags within Ninjago, Spinjitsu and Garmadon Army. I haven't seen any events yet about Ninjago, but there are some Brickspedition missions that require Ninjago plus either pirate or collectible. Garmadon has a humongous heal in his special ability called Underworld Stuff. Ninjagos are about stealth, which is a buff that makes it so you can't target the minifigure that has it unless everybody has stealth. Pirates are all explorers, although we covered earlier that Skeleton Yorick is a builder too. Pirates are made up of two smaller tags plus Yorick. The non-Yorick pirates are either buccaneers or imperial. Pirate-only teams are required for the weekly event Peglegs Treasure. There are also some Brickspedition missions that require Pirate plus one other team, such as Castle or Ninjago. Pirates are about putting debuffs on their enemies, and about Captain Redbeard's passive ability, Captain's Presence, which lets him counterattack when a different pirate is damaged. Space heroes are all explorers. There are some smaller tags within this. Alien only applies to Gorwell and Locust. Blacktron only applies to Blacktron astronaut Dwayne. Daddy. The update added another Black Chan hero, Black Chan Quincy. Ice Planet is for Dr. Kelvin and Commander oh, Cole, and Classic Space only oh. applies to Spaceman Reed. Daddy, the update added another Classic Space hero, Spaceman Jens. Space only teams are required for the weekly event Gorwell's Great Escape. There are also some Brickspedition missions that require space plus one other team, such as Castle or Collectible. Space teams are about controlling the other team's turns, with debuffs such as Stun and Debilitate, and with abilities that increase their pep or reduce their foe's pep. They also have Commander Cold, who puts buffs everywhere, especially for space. The last team is collectible. I put them at the end because they're not a real team. They're just a miscellaneous or other category. Collectibles sometimes show up together in campaigns or Brickspedition, but they don't really have synergies with each other. Anytime they have synergies, it always seems to be with City instead. There are no collectible events as far as I know, but it's common to have collectible plus one other team such as Castle or Ninjago in Brickspedition. They're also the team that I see show up the most often for excavation bonus rewards in Brickspedition. There are also some smaller tags such as Spooky, which don't completely align with the teams and give some bonuses in hero or set abilities. That's enough about tags. Let's start with stuff you'd need to do on day one of playing the game. You have three things to do immediately. Task number one, battle the new levels until your energy starts recharging. Don't loot at the start because these levels don't have anything good. You're going to level up a lot on day one, which will keep giving you more campaign energy, so this might take a lot of battles. Task number two. Between battles, level up all your heroes to your Piptown level. This is just for day one. When you have more heroes than you're allowed to use, you'll have to leave some behind so you have enough XP scrolls and coins for your best heroes. Task number three. Between battles, stick any gear you got on your heroes. 
For times when you've got to pick a hero for gear, prioritize Chicken Suit Guy because he has an ultimate ability, and then go to your most useful heroes such as Hiker. Now let's move on to slightly longer term tasks. There are four, but one of them is about doing multiple things. Task number one, do your daily stuff. I'll cover this later. Task number two, unlock Monolith Waste. Monolith Waste has a separate pool of energy, and you're just keeping it at the cap, not recharging it, until you battle Monolith Waste. You unlock Monolith Waste by being Piptown United 1.8. Task number three, get five builders. This is number three instead of number two, because you can easily unlock Monolith Waste with four builders. You want to get three builders right away, though, who will be Cactus Girl, Headley the Headsman, and Princess Ferda. You get Cactus Girl tiles by leveling up, so you have her by level 10. You get Princess Ferda and the tiles to make her a two-star through the Captain Kidnap event. You get Headley the Hedgeman tiles by looting Glyph Hunt 2.81. Later, you'll also have Monolith Waste 1.8. You also get 5 Headley tiles as a one-time reward for beating Pip Town United 1.1, which you can do with Cactus Girl by herself. Unless you get lucky with some daily goodie bag or mismanage this horribly, builder number 4 should be Paramedic Poppy. Paramedic Poppy was our most important builder for Pip Town United chapters 1 to 5. Magisto was our most important builder for Pip Town United chapter 6. As a reminder, we gold trophied all of Piptown United with the old, good paramedic Poppy, but I'm not sure if you really have a better choice right now. You might want to roll with Chef because of his better defense, but he still doesn't have a cooldown 3 heal, and he's harder to get tiles for because he's way in the back of Monolith Waste Chapter 3. Your builder number 5 is likely to be Nia, who is in Piptown United 1.h2, or Street Sweeper Sal, who is in Monolith Waste 1.4. Task number four, finish the house hunting event so you have a two-star Lego house. This is a good set you're allowed to use in all three groups of campaigns, plus all challenges and a bunch of events such as missing materials. When you said daily stuff earlier, did you mean daily quests? That's part of it. You're going to have two or more challenges every day. You can beat any of these from day one except for Gear Challenge 2, which won't be playable until you get a support. It's too hard to beat it until you get two, probably Nia and Dr. Kelvin. You'll also have two events playable each day, which change at 3 p.m. Universal Time. You should be able to beat Tier 1 for any of these right away, except for Gorwell's Great Escape and Missing Materials, which will say you don't have enough eligible heroes. You should be battling or looting the event until you get rewarded three times, and then doing this again when it lets you after 5 a.m. Universal Time. So each weekly event will pay out six times per week. There's also collecting the goodie bags. One is daily, and the others can be collected four hours after you collected the last one, unless it gets too close to 1 a.m. Universal Time, and then it'll make you wait until the daily goodie bag reset time of 5 a.m. Universal Time. Then we finally get to the daily quests. You should be finishing these every day and collecting Captain Redbeard tiles. The tasks change a little as you level up. When you're at a relatively low level, you should have a quest about leveling up a hero. Early on, you level up every day, or maybe even multiple times per day, so this is pretty easy. You'll just get this by leveling up your best heroes with your Piptown level, but if you want a little extra protection, try this. When you have a sixth explorer you don't intend to use, such as Darwin the Pirate, make sure you're leaving one back by at least one level so you can level that hero up for the quest if you're stuck. Another early level quest that goes away later is Equip One Piece of Gear. This is similar to the last one in that you get this gear by battling and looting anyway, at least at low levels. If you want to back up, leave one piece of gear unequipped on one of the Darwin-like heroes you don't use. There are always various quests about completing missions. For level 50, these include complete 7 missions, complete 5 Glyph Hunt missions, complete 5 Piptown United missions, and complete 5 Monolith Waste missions. Completing missions includes battling and looting, and for battling, losing counts too. For the three campaign groups, they start at 2 instead of 5, and Piptown United and Monolith Waste aren't included until you unlock them. There's also a quest for level 50 called Complete Three Hard Missions. 
I believe this starts as complete one hard mission. The reason this has a star by it is that the hard missions are the ones that have stars instead of circles on the map. They also have H in their campaign numbers. Hard missions are most of what you should be looting in Glyph Hunt and Pip Town United, so this overlaps with the other mission quests. Another one that overlaps is a quest about looting missions. For level 50, it's loot 5 missions. It starts at a smaller number. You should mainly be looting anyway, so this is easy to get. Two of the daily quests are for things I already listed in Daily Stuff to do. There's complete two challenge missions and open one bag. Just go to challenges in the shop to complete these. There's a quest complete two arena battles, which starts when you're level 18 and have the arena. Your early battles are pretty fast and easy, so I suggest doing all five battles allowed each day anyway. We'll cover the arena in a separate video, but this is what you need to know right now. Don't just take in the team the game suggests, which goes by total awesomeness and will be all tanks and attackers. Start with a team of three attackers and two healers, and once you get into Silver 1, i.e. the top 500, switch out one of the attackers for a tank if you have a good tank. If you really hate the arena, just do two battles on auto, because losing counts for the quest too. Daddy, the update started paying out arena rewards, coins, and XP scrolls for each arena win. Okay, so I suppose auto all five per day if you hate the arena. There's no downside in losing compared to not playing. There's a quest called Use One Brick Separator on a set. This is really heavily searched on YouTube, and I don't know why, because the quests all have this go button that takes you to the right place. The first time you go here, too, the game shows you. Drag the orange brick separator on top of one of the sets you have, let go, and it pays out. Then you go back to daily quests and claim that reward, too. Don't just drag these to any sets. El Dorado Fortress is the best set for brick separators, despite being a terrible set in battle because it's built for Imperials. You don't get El Dorado Fortress until you get enough tiles in the Brickspedition event, which I believe unlocks at level 25. In the meantime, use Lighthouse Point, which pays out basic Banana 1 plan. If you don't have Lighthouse Point, do the start of the Keep the Light On event so you can use it for brick separators. FYI, you can get a 2 star Lighthouse Point from Keep the Light On when you're low level, and a 2 plus star Lighthouse Point is a good battle set when Paramedic Poppy is in. You get a brick separator every day with your Captain Redbeard tiles. Don't use that one because you need it for the next day's quest. I suggest only using the one minimum brick separator per day until you get Eldorado Fortress anyway, because your early sets all pay out basic gear instead of lofty gear, and tier 1 ability elixir instead of tier 2. The last daily quest I know is get 3 items from the shop. This starts as get 1 item from the shop because some areas of the shop are locked or irrelevant at low levels. This is not a pay to win quest. I probably average 8 items per day from the shop. I don't remember which parts of the shop you have at each level, but you always at least have bundles, bags and supplies, gems, and general. Ignore bundles and gems, which are pay-to-win sections. Bags and supplies has some bags of tiles and gear that you should ignore too, but then it has XP scrolls and coins you buy for gems. Early on, these are going to be what you're best off buying if you don't see anything good in general. I'll cover this in a lot more detail after I finish taking you through the shop. The general section is mainly awful deals, such as these codex tiles. Just get your codex tiles for looting. These don't give you enough for the gems you spend, plus you won't have the coins to star up your heroes if you're spending your gems on tiles. So there's no point in having the tiles. Ignore this gear and other stuff for gems too, but the gear for coins at the top is very interesting if you understand which ones you'll need. But that's the problem. You won't know which ones are useful until you get more heroes and gear them up. In the meantime, I'll give you a few items that always seem to be in demand. For the basic gear, look for basic banana one plan, basic coffee one plan, basic flintlock one plan, basic helm one plan, basic hard hat one plan, basic chop one plan, and basic dynamite one plan in that order. For the lofty gear, look for lofty dynamite one plan, lofty skateboard one plan, lofty shield one plan, lofty helm one plan, lofty coffee one plan, and Lofty Chop 1 plan in that order. Don't ignore the Basic versus Lofty part. For example, Lofty Skateboard 1 plan is always in demand, but Basic Skateboard 1 plan is always abundant. Also, don't worry about how some of these are in hard levels. Demolition Dummy has Lofty Chop 1 plan, Fitness Instructor has Lofty Coffee 1 plan, Headley the Headsman has Basic Chop 1 plan, Jester Gogo has Basic Flintlock 1 plan, and Locust has Basic Hard Hat 1 plan and Lofty Helm 1 plan. But you can only loot these six times a day, and they'll pay out maybe one piece of gear, so it's still in demand. 
So you might be wondering, why did I just tell you to ignore gear for gems, but then tell you to buy gear for coins and buy coins for gems? I know it's roundabout, but the math says that's the smart plan. If you buy with gems, you get 5 basic 1 plans for 50 gems, so 1 for 10 gems. If you buy with coins, you get 1 for 700 coins. Exchange 1,120 gems for 1,610,000 coins, and your coin purchase is 1 basic 1 plan for 0 0.487 gems. So the gem purchase costs 20.536 times as much as the coin purchase for the same item. Lofty isn't quite as good a buy, but it's still a better exchange rate through coins, and buying gear with coins frees your looting up for more codex tiles. You're going to get gems anyway, mainly through the arena, and you'll get coins with gems, the Peglegs treasure event, and the Brickspedition event. Let's go through the other sections of the store that exist for level 50s. The Brickspedition store unlocks when you get Brickspedition. You use relics, which are rewards you get for each Brickspedition adventure you beat. All three types of codex tiles in the Brickspedition store are good. They just started putting Hank the Castaway here, and I think that if you're new enough that you haven't invested in Imperials for Peglegs treasure, I'd be going with Hank until he's at least 5 stars. Hank's a buccaneer, so he'll get the extra counterattack probability for Captain Redbeard. He also attacks really hard, especially through monkey business, if he's starred up and geared up enough. Dojo Showdown is a set for Spinjitzus. This should be the choice if you're relying on Kai, and to a lesser extent Zane, in the last adventure of Brickspedition maps, even if it's a guild ally. Kai and Zane are awesome attackers, but their weakness is accuracy, which coincides with all the cheating the game does in Brickspedition to generate a million dodges in this Brickspedition adventure. Dojo Showdown improves their accuracy and their attack, making it a lot easier to finish maps. The mashup store should be getting you rewards every day. You have four heroes codex tiles, plus four bad choices. All four of these heroes are good, but you should be getting Zane tiles and ignoring the others until you get Zane to six stars. Then go to Pirate Cook Bart until you get what you need out of your explorer and pirate teams. After that, figure it out among the four heroes based on your specific needs. Why Zane? He's only available in the mashup shop, bags, and the Grand Champion time quest, and you can't count on the last one. He's a vicious attacker with a ton of speed. He has an all attack, he puts defense down and vulnerable on foes, and most importantly, he adds Dizzy for two turns with his basic ability. This is really important for fighting castle teams, which you'll need to do all the time in arena, events, and campaigns, because they can't counterattack if they're Dizzy. <laughs> Pirate Princess Argenta can add Dizzy too, but hers is with an all attack, so if they've got a guarded in putting payback on a lot of people, she's going to get herself killed adding that Dizzy. So why stop Zane at 6 stars? It's because Zane was our highest awesomeness hero on our team that we already used to beat all of Pip Town United and all of Monolith Waste. The campaigns are the most important parts of the game, and you already used him for the stuff where you needed him before he is 7 star, then you can turn over to Pirate Cook Bart, who's also a really important hero. I've seen some talk of using Mashup until you get Pirate Cook Bart to 3 stars, because you'd use him plus Captain Redbeard and Pirate Princess Argenta in Tier 3 of Peglegs Treasure. Don't get me wrong, Pirate Cook Bart is a fantastic hero, and you do use these three in this event mission, but this is not the right approach, using Mashup. You basically blink and get a 3 star Argenta, but this isn't the case with Redbeard. You have to do daily quests for 22 days to make him a 3 star. Pirate Cook Bart, on the other hand, is in Pip Town United 2.H4. You should be max looting that level every day, not using your mashup on him early. You'll also get Pirate Cook Bart tiles in Brickspedition, where he should be a really high and often top priority for you, and from Explorers 101. Plus, going from Tier 2 to Tier 3 in Peglegs Treasure isn't a big deal. The coins increase 42.9%. Going from Tier 3 to Tier 4, or Tier 4 to Tier 5, the coins increase 100%. It's really Tier 5 where Peglegs gives you huge coin relief because each week it's giving you nearly enough coins for a star up from 6 to 7 stars. For Tier 4 or Tier 5, the slow step is Captain Valiant, not Pirate Cook Bart. If you're new, that'll be Scarlet the Buccaneer instead of Captain Valiant, but the star up speed is basically the same. Princess Verda is a castle, which is cool, but she's super overrated because you gear her up early and you're used to seeing her as a 2-star competing with 1-stars. Castle isn't as important as Pirate. They go into the book learning event, which pays out an insignificant number of XP scrolls. 
She's not a staple of your builder lineup like Zane is. Once you reach Piptown United Chapter 3, she can be bumped for Magisto or maybe even a two-tank lineup. She has great speed but bad max health and defense, so she has to waste turns going on stealth. She also doesn't upgrade well with tier ability elixir like Zane does, and she can be looted easily in Glyph Hunt if you like her. And you can play her along Zane in early Piptown United levels because you get 30 tiles in the Captain Kidnap event. Businessman Trent is good but not great. He's lootable in Monolith Waste and he gets a lot of tiles from Brickspedition. He won't crack your builder lineup because there are so many great builders. He can be on your first Missing Materials team, but you don't need to use Mashup to find 5 bodies for that event. The guild section of the shop has 4 heroes tiles, 1 sets tiles, and 4 bad choices. With the guilds now opening up at lower levels, I now think you should start with Minor Clay just until you unlock him and can throw him into the Missing Materials event. As a hero, Minor Clay begins with Stink and ends with E, but he's got lots of defense which makes his total awesomeness high. The point in getting him though is that the Missing Materials event starts requiring 5 city heroes, and you just want to start getting something instead of nothing in that event. Also, all the guild shop heroes are pretty stinky, so you can focus on getting 5 warm bodies to throw into Missing Materials. Winning tier 1 isn't a cakewalk, but at least you'll have a 2 star. He needs gear though, and don't use his special ability Safety Officer. After you unlock Minor Clay or beat Missing Materials Tier 1, switch to the LEGO House until you get at least 35 tiles this way. That plus house hunting will give you a 3 star set. Daddy, don't you say heroes over sets? Yes, but there are a few exceptions and these heroes are bad. It would be different for builders because you have two good builder sets in the Bad Tour event, Guarded In and Lighthouse Point. Bad Tour has one good explorer set, Spy Track 1, and this isn't a good enough Glyph Hunt set because its value is really for playing against Lloyd, who's only in a few Glyph Hunt missions. I beat Glyph Hunt through 6.7 with the Lego House, which is for builders and explorers. I even used it in a bunch of Pip Town United missions before Guarded In got starred up enough. The LEGO House's biggest value is getting rid of foe's buffs. You'll mainly want it to clear Taunt and the counterattack buff Payback, but it can clear others too, such as Damage Block. The LEGO House has other abilities that aren't as good, called Home of the Brick and Leg Day. After you get the LEGO House starred up enough, switch to Princess Storm. She's only available in the guild shop in some pay-to-win bags, and she's a castle. She's not a great hero, but you need startup <laughs> castles for some requirements, plus starring up fixes a lot of problems. Missing materials is more important than book learning, but city heroes are easier to get than castle heroes. Before too long, you'll have heroes such as Arctic Explorer Aurora, Firefighter Ash, Chef, and Businessman Trent, so you'll have to bench Miner Clay, plus more useful city heroes anyway. Also note that missing materials doesn't have any star requirements, unlike the castle events. The worst choice for tiles here is Dr. Kelvin. She certainly can go into Glyph Hunt chapters 2 to 5, and should be a staple of your Gear Challenge 2 and Gorwell's Great Escape teams. However, she's really easy to loot for in Monolith Waste, so she doesn't need Guild Reward tiles too. Similarly, Zombie got added to Monolith Waste 4.2. He and Spooky Girl are both event characters. They start at 1 star, but their events will give you the tiles and coins to make them 2 stars. Zombie's fine as an attacker, but has terrible total awesomeness and is difficult to gear up. I think total awesomeness doesn't give him enough credit for reviving, but he's a collectible, so we're going by tags. Spooky Girl's also a collectible builder attacker. There are better builder attackers, and collectible's a pretty useless team tag. Spooky Girl is like Princess Verda in that she is designed to operate on stealth and she has an all attack. I'm not a big fan of these stealth attackers because they stress your other four while they're hiding. You can live with that for Highwayman because his attack is so strong, but Spooky Girl's attack is more on Verda's level. Good, but not incredible. I think she'll always be slightly outside your Pip Town United lineup, so deal with your main explorer set and castle requirements. In the arena shop, start with Firefighter Ash and continue until you either unlock her or beat Missing Materials Tier 1. She's not the best hero in this shop section. She's got a huge attack and great speed, but regrettable max health and defense. This is just for getting some missing materials looting going. After that, go to Scarlet the Buccaneer and stick with her all the way until 7 stars. I think Scarlet's the best tank in the whole game. I would have loved to have had a startup version for the arena and glyph on all the way until 6.8, but they just added her to the arena shop with this September 2020 update, so it's too late for me. 
Scarlet's a buccaneer, so she gets the best counterattack probability from Captain Redbeard, and she can go into the Peglegs treasure event. You need 5 4-star pirates and then 5 5-star five pirates for Peglegs treasure tiers 4 and 5. This star requirement keeps going for the last two tiers of Peglegs treasure. She taunts with a passive ability. Passive abilities are things heroes can do even when it's not their turn. This means you can't defeat somebody before she starts taunting the way you could with, say, Captain Valiant. She only taunts for one turn, but they didn't program this correctly, so as soon as the other team starts hitting someone else, a new one turn starts and she's effectively always taunting. She's also got crazy max health and defense, she has a big self heal, and she can get rid of foes taunts with her special ability Frothy Fury, even at tier 1. Captain Valiant also has a ridiculous amount of defense, and his passive ability I Am Rubber makes that even higher when he's taunting. And he's a pirate who can go into peg legs, but he's Imperial instead of Buccaneer, so Scarlet should be the choice unless Valiant's already ahead by 50 tiles or more. If he is, take him to 5 stars at least, and maybe 7 before switching to Scarlet or possibly back to Ash. Pirate teams make for very good arena teams, so Scarlet or Valiant would fill the very important job of the tank in these cases. Why you need a tank on these pirate arena teams is for when some human is playing against your team, which the computer is controlling. It's pretty easy to beat the no-tank teams by hitting Captain Redbeard with one attacks until he's defeated. When a pirate tank taunts, though, the human is getting counterattacked by Captain Redbeard, and it's very difficult to put a dizzy debuff on somebody that can't be targeted. The other three good enough options in the arena shop are Firefighter Ash, Lloyd, and Crown King Brutus. I'd probably 7-star them in that order, although you might want to do some Ash starring up before 7-starring Valiant. The last tier, Tier 5, of Missing Materials pays out Tier 3 Ability Elixir, but has a ton of level 50 5-star foes, so your 2-star Firefighter Ash certainly isn't getting the job done. Lots of people love Lloyd, or Lloyd as Garmadon would call him. He's a nice gadget piece, but he won't work as your main tank or main builder tank unless you structure absolutely everything else around him, which is too many compromises for my liking. What's to like about Lloyd? He's difficult to defeat, especially because he has a really impressive heal attack special ability, Master of Energy. He also hits very well for a tank. And he has some overrated aspects, because Brickspedition Map 7 always finishes with some ridiculous Ninjago team filled with the game's cheating and two Lloyds. The main characteristics about Lloyd as a tank are that he uses a stealth buff on the others instead of a taunt buff on himself, and he's got speed 130, which is just crazy. The speed lets him start protecting attackers early, so you can't kill a Firefighter Ash or Kai before the taunt starts. The stealth approach is nice in that it's harder to clear stealth buffs than taunt buffs, which get cleared by Dragon Master Burnabus, Magisto, Major Kartofsky, and the Lego House. As you get used to using Lloyd, though, you'll find that he doesn't protect your heroes as well as a classic tank does. You'll need to understand how turns and buffs and debuffs work to get why stealth tanks don't work. When a hero puts a buff or debuff on another minifigure for two turns, the first turn is from the first hero's turn until the other minifigure's next turn. Zane's really fast and tends to go right after Lloyd, and then the first turn is already up before any foes had a chance to attack. The second turn is then from that turn Zane just took to another Zane turn, which goes by really quickly because of Zane's speed. When you experience Lloyd's two stealth turns enough times, you'll keep getting baffled at how quickly your heroes start getting unprotected, especially high-speed heroes that you want to protect, such as Magisto or Hiker. It's also concerning how they don't all get unprotected at the same time, so the foes might have two targeting choices which might be Lloyd and Hiker, instead of five. All the other tanks are slow. When one of these tanks taunts, the taunt is from that tank's turn until two slow tank turns later, which is more than two turns of protection for your faster heroes. If you're going to use Lloyd, you'd want to build around some slower heroes, such as Kai, Arctic Explorer Aurora, and Pirate Cook Bart. It's generally not a great idea to try to get low speed in your attack, though, because you're getting fewer hits than your foes are. Still, Lloyd has enough interesting stuff that he's worth having as some utility piece. Crown King Brutus is similarly overrated, but you need high star castle heroes for event restrictions. Like Lloyd and Ash, you can't get his tiles by looting, although he is in Builders 101 and has shown up in Grand Champion like Lloyd has. He's also in Brickspedition like Ash. 
Brutus is like the point guard in basketball, but he's distributing taunts, not the rock. To have the Brutus system work, he has to keep forcing the other team to hit someone new, while some all-healer in the back, generally a skeleton castle healer, is healing the old taunter and the new taunter at the same time. You don't have the skeleton, so you'll have to use Hiker instead. It's hard to do this, especially in the arena, because it's easy to trick a computer-controlled Brutus into stupidly throwing his taunt on someone such as Hiker, who has a ton of max health. Bo Brutus, which is your Brutus if some worst-ranked human is trying to beat your arena team, just throws the taunt on whoever has the most health left. So you just beat up the higher health than Hiker heroes until Hiker has the most health. Brutus also has problems being paired with tanks or other taunters, because they taunt on their own, giving the other team choices in whom they hit. I generally like to go after Brutus's tanks early because it's predictable that you can defeat them and reduce his choices. Why Brutus is so overrated is that the game keeps trying to sell castle hero tiles by featuring Brutus in seven foe sets, with skeletons, magistos with the ultimate ability Morphgisto, combinations of Basil the Batlord and Will of the Witch, and other things you're not going to be able to reproduce in your five hero sets easily. Without all this cheating, Brutus is much more mortal. I think that Brutus can work, but you'd have to combine him with high defense support, such as the two Ice Planet heroes. I think it's more difficulty than it's worth, though, so I leave my Brutus on the bench. He does hit and dodge well, though, and he's a castle, so I could see somebody moving him ahead of Lloyd in the order based on the tags. I didn't include Blacktron Astronaut Dwayne and Private Laquay in the good enough choices. The main reason is that they're easily lootable in Monolith Waste. Dwayne just got an overhaul in his abilities, but they're not noticeably better, and his ratings still stink. You'll need him for the Gorwell's Great Escape and Early Adopters events, but just loot. Private Laquay becomes more usable at high levels because his basic ability scales up nicely, but that has hero level restrictions, and he's not good enough to go in at low levels. All three of our accounts used him for Peglegs Treasure because he's easy to star up by looting, but now you have Hank the Castaway in the Brickspedition store. Hank's a better attacker, and more importantly, he's a buccaneer instead of Imperial, so you get more counterattack. The last part of the shop, the Master section, can be ignored for a long, long time. When you have 7 star heroes, getting more tiles can't star them up, so the game trades you 5 master tiles for 1 unusable hero tile. It takes 600 master tiles to get 3 hero tiles, so you're trading 40 tiles of one hero for one of another hero. That's an awful exchange, so I wouldn't make any effort to get master tiles. If you got enough of these tiles through goodie bags, though, I suppose I'd pick Will of the Witch ahead of Major Kartofsky. Major Kartofsky has a much better attack and interesting buff control, but Willa has an ultimate ability, and more importantly, her passive ability can reassemble Basil the Batlord. If you've been around long enough to get Willa, you should have already gotten and starred up Basil through his event alumni days. Since the September 2020 update, we've gotten both of these hero tiles not in the Master Store. We got three Willa tiles in this terrible Brickspedition Heroes time quest that made us win 20 Brickspedition missions with the big liability Clockwork Robot as a hero. We got tons of Major Kartofsky tiles through the Early Adopters event. It was actually half the price of Blacktron Astronaut Quincy. It's easier to get Major Kartofsky tiles elsewhere than Willa tiles, so use Master tiles on Willa. So, the store and daily quests are almost done. There are a handful of comments I made earlier, though, that are probably confusing you if you're a noob. I've referred to the importance of coins and getting them through Pegleg's treasure, plus the idea of buying XP scrolls and coins with gems. If you're low level, this probably seems like a really stupid idea, and you're wondering why you don't use gems on codex tiles instead. At the start, it seems like you have tons of scrolls and coins, but the costs go up like crazy. This video is going to show you the level up costs from 1 to each level from 2 to 50. We've done the subtraction on the side for the one level up cost we're going to tell you. I'm just going to talk about XP scrolls, because the coin comparisons are the same. The one level coin costs are all 10 times the one level scroll costs, except leveling up from 4 to 5 and from 10 to 11. Those are 10 times the scrolls plus 5 more coins, and I don't think you're going to care about 5 coins when you're paying 1.5 million coins to star up a hero. Going from level 1 to level 2 costs 3 scrolls. Going from level 9 to level 10 costs 27 scrolls, which is still the sort of thing you get by looting. Going from level 19 to level 20 costs 262 scrolls, and 20 to 21 costs 312 scrolls, which is already more than 10 times the 9 to 10 cost, and more than 100 times the 1 to 2 cost. You're already at the point where you're not getting these scrolls and coins from your looting. Going from level 29 to level 30 costs 1,212 scrolls, 
which is over 4.6 times the 19 to 20 cost. Going from level 39 to level 40 costs 3,162 scrolls. So you're in the area where book learning and tier 3 peglegs treasure might let you level up a few heroes one level in a week. Campaign looting rewards are negligible at this point, but Brickspedition might give a little relief. Going from level 49 to level 50 costs 6,112 scrolls, which is a little over 2,037 times the cost to go from level 1 to level 2. As a reminder, this one hero, one level cost is 61,120 coins, which is absolutely massive and much higher than those coin costs for even lofty gear. As if that isn't bad enough, XP scrolls are just used for leveling up, but coins are used for way more. The gear made from plan items is basically everything you equip going from gear 3 to gear 6. Even if you get the plan items by looting, you still need to pay coins to turn the plans into the full gear item that can be equipped. You also need coins in addition to tier ability elixir to improve heroes' abilities. The biggest coin costs, though, are for starring up. Going from 1 to 2 stars costs 50,000 coins. Note that building doesn't cost anything, so heroes such as Captain Redbeard who start at 2 stars don't require the 50,000 coins. Going from 2 to 3 stars costs 100,000 coins. Going from 3 to 4 stars costs 250,000 coins. Going from 4 to 5 stars costs 500,000 coins. Going from 5 to 6 stars costs a million coins. And going from 6 to 7 stars costs 1.5 million coins. Oh, by the way, starring up sets has the same coin costs as starring up heroes. The moral of the story is that you're getting nowhere with scrolls, and an even bigger nowhere with coins, unless you get scrolls and coins with gems. When you gold trophy tier 5 of Peglegs treasure, you'll pull in 1.2 million coins a week through it if you loot the proper 6 times. However, you're battling 10 level 55 stars, including Yuppie and Highwayman, so you've got no shot without using gems to get 5 heroes to become level 55 stars. So let's go to a resource management question. How should you spend your gems? It should be 90% coins, 10% scrolls, and 0% other. Try to buy the big packs because they're more efficient. There is one very minor exception. If you're not yet level 50 and you're doing the Power Hungry time quest, you might level up, giving you a burst of campaign energy. Between this and energy efficiency, you might be 150 gem energy refresh away from the big prize. The value of the package, including codex tiles and coins, is probably worth 50 gems, but the energy isn't by itself. The game is going to give you a ridiculous number of opportunities to waste your gems, but remember that for all intents and purposes, the only good uses are coins and scrolls. These terrible uses include energy refreshes that aren't the difference in getting a timed quest grand prize, skipping cooldown periods between arena battles, going over the five battle arena daily limit, refreshing the store, and going over the 6, 12, or 100 time looting limits on levels. For the most part, you just have to be patient and wait for these, like the 7 minutes between arena battles, or the 4 times the shop changes per day, at 5 and 11 a.m. and p.m. universal time. Looting limits on levels should be followed anyway. There are a lot of heroes who need codex tiles or gear, so you can't get fixated on one with your limited energy supply. I've actually heard so-called experts on YouTube recommending two of these horrible wastes of gems. Let's go over the 5 battle arena limit. You move up quickly in the arena, so you can get into gold 2 or gold 3 before you know it when you're still in the times when your peers are level 30 or whatever. This gold 2 versus gold 3 barrier is really the important one for free-to-play players. If you're debating gold 3 versus silver 1 or silver 1 versus silver 2, the map holds even more. Arena placement leads to arena rewards too, but the big prize is the gems. If you go from gold 3 to gold 2 by buying extra battles, you just used 50 gems to get 25. Not smart. If you went from silver 1 to gold 3, you used 50 gems to get 20. Also, if you get too high compared to the total awesomeness of your starting 5, you'll just get knocked down more when your team is on defense, so you won't even be jumping arena tiers in any lasting way. I've probably spit a bunch of liquid out in shock hearing various people on YouTube advocating using gems on energy every day. Seriously, energy recharges for free. Just wait. We went over how the level up costs are 10 coins for every scroll. 
When you buy scrolls or coins for gems, you get 4 coins per scroll with the small pack, 4.125 coins per scroll with the medium pack, and 4.025 coins per scroll with the big pack. So you're getting a ratio of 4 or slightly over 4 with the coin buys, which is much less than 10, so clearly scrolls for gems are a much better value than coins for gems. You might be tempted to buy the scrolls for gems and not the coins for gems, but you don't have that choice just because they're a better value. When you level up, you need scrolls and coins, and you're not allowed to exchange scrolls for 10 coins, or any amount of coins for that matter. So you need to get a lot of coins, and you have three choices. Only one of them is a good choice. You can buy coins with real money. Bad, bad choice. You can buy coins with gems. You hate the value, but it's the only reasonable choice. Or you can go really slowly with leveling up, starring up, gearing up, and upgrading abilities. That's another bad choice. Let's take a closer look at this thought so-called experts promote about buying energy. Regardless of which level you loot, you get 40 coins per unit of energy used. It doesn't even matter whether this is campaign energy or mashup energy. You can buy 100 campaign or mashup energy for 50 gems twice a day. Then it starts becoming 100 gems per 100 energy. Let's consider both of these exchange rates. If you buy energy with the first two recharges, you're getting 8,000 coins plus other stuff per 100 gems. After that, buying energy recharges gets you 4,000 coins plus other stuff per 100 gems. If you buy the big pack of coins, you're getting 143,750 coins per 100 gems. Even if you buy the small pack, you're getting 125,000 coins per 100 gems. Azalea, what's bigger, 8,000 or 125,000? 125,000. Yep. Even with the worst coin purchase exchange rate and the best energy purchase exchange rate, you're getting almost 16 times more coins per gem by buying coins. With the best coin purchase exchange rate and the unlimited energy purchase exchange rate, you're getting almost 36 times more coins per gem by buying coins. And I know some of you are saying, but, but, but you get all that other stuff looting. It doesn't matter. You need lots and lots of coins. You can't exchange headley tiles or basic skateboard one plan or whatever for coins. When you get that other stuff, you just generate more coin needs because you need the coins to accompany the tiles for starring up, and you need the coins to combine the plan gear into usable gear. That's why the gem management is 90% coins, 10% scrolls, and 0% other. You need the extra coin purchases to make up for the worst gem exchange rate and the way that coins get used in more than leveling up. Okay, we almost wrapped up another massive amount of content. We've still got more coming, such as how to invest energy, which is part of our part 3 video. What about buffs and debuffs? Part 4. What about guilds? That's right now. As we mentioned in part 1, you get the chance to join a group of players called a guild, and this seems to be at level 9 now, so it's a clear day 1 issue. We also mentioned last time that the main value in the guild is borrowing guild allies, and that you should make sure you join a guild with 40 plus members that has at least 3 usable guild allies. I'd simplified the usable part to be level 50, but you probably need them to be 5 to 7 stars too. I don't think people are going to be sharing many level 50s that aren't at least 5 stars, but stars matter too. If it's a gear 6 Kai or Highwayman, you're probably fine at 5 stars too. Look for the three green lines to see that they're gear 6. In this video, we talked about the guild section of the shop. You get a little part of these rewards as guild sharing rewards, and the bulk of them through guild quests. You don't need to pay attention to guild quests. You get plenty of these rewards by being active, and the rest of your guild changes the numbers somewhat, but not enough for you to pick guilds based on this. If you get a more active guild, you'll get better rewards based on the group tier, but worse rewards based on your ranking within the guild. The guild sharing part is more interesting because you get more incremental rewards for easy actions. When you join a guild, share an explorer and a builder. It doesn't matter which you share because nobody's going to borrow your level 9 one-star cactus girl or whatever anyway. You'll get a small one-time reward for sharing, though. As you get your heroes good enough that you think somebody conceivably would want to borrow them, start resharing them every time their total awesomeness improves, e.g. when you level the hero up. Otherwise, the guild will keep the old version of the hero and nobody will borrow them. As for borrowing heroes, you should borrow the maximum three per day. 
When you borrow a hero, you get 10 guild rewards for borrowing them right when the mission's over. The sharer also gets 10 guild rewards per borrow, but they get them at midnight universal time, and there's a universal time daily limit of 50 guild rewards from other people borrowing. That's 5 a.m. universal time like the challenges for the cap, and midnight universal time for the payout. You can't borrow the same hero twice in a day, except that you can borrow them once for campaigns and once at Brickspedition. Note that Brickspedition borrowing doesn't produce guild rewards for the borrower. The sharer used to get no rewards too, but it seems with the September 2020 update that the sharer now gets 10 guild rewards per borrow. You can borrow more than two allies from the same person in a day, but they'd have to change who they're sharing during the day, which is pretty hard to coordinate unless you're running both accounts. Note that when you change a guild ally, there's usually a lag of a few minutes before the new ally shows up for others. You can't have the same hero in from your team who's the guild ally, so if you really want to borrow a certain guild ally, you'll have to leave out your version of that hero. Also remember that the explorer builder restrictions that apply to your heroes apply to the guild allies too. In Brickspedition, the other restrictions such as Pirate and Ninjago also apply to the guild allies. Especially when you're low level, you want to borrow attackers, especially ones with all attacks and high speed. If you don't have any good attacker guild allies, borrow tanks. Don't borrow healers unless it's Arctic Explorer Aurora. Their big heal is just going to get wasted on your low max health heroes. Use your own healers. The idea here is that the all attackers will just defeat all the low level foes by themselves before the foes get any chance to defeat your heroes. If the tank is much higher in level and stars than the foes, they can just take all the hits and get basically no damage, but your heroes can still get damaged with a tank in. High level borrowing is pretty specific to what's available and what would be an upgrade on your hero. For low level players, the explorer of choice should be Locust if level, stars, and so on are the same. He's got tons of speed, he has two all attacks, and he can taunt to protect your heroes. After Locust, I'd go to Yeti, Arctic Explorer Aurora, and Chicken Suit Guy, in that order. Chicken Suit Guy is high speed and has two good all attacks, but you'd have to take out your own, which starts at three stars and gears up quickly. The builder of choice should be Basil the Batlord. Basil the Batlord is on the top because he attacks and taunts at the same time and gets healed from his basic called Bat Chapter. Do not use his special ability, The Needs of Many, unless you're desperate. Basil the Batlord's ability called The Needs of Many is his first special. After that, the builders in order should be Zane, Princess Verda, Spooky Girl, and Yuppie. The three attackers are in order of speed. If you use Verda or Spooky Girl, don't use their stealth. Yuppie is on the list for the same reason as Arctic Explorer Aurora. He can reassemble your low-level heroes if they get defeated. Unlike Aurora, he also attacks well, and for any hero he reassembles, he increases their pep and gives them the hardy buff, which helps you heal them before they get defeated again. Arctic Explorer Aurora gives hardy if the hero he reassembles is a shitty hero. Well, this has already been a Demolition Dummy Size Part 2, so I think that's good enough, and we can leave the more advanced topics for Part 3. Now since it's the end of the video, and we've gone through who you should borrow as a guild ally, goodbye. Remember to like and subscribe and watch all of our videos.